Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, to this study. Happy Sabbath. And we're going to continue looking at the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. We've gone through a lot of material. Uh, we finished off uh, the two books on Galatians, Butler and Wagner. So we mostly read Wagner's quoting of Butler and then Wagner's response. Now we're going to look at something. But this is a little bit more troubling. Um, this is going to be Wagner's confession of faith. The last thing he wrote before he died. And so it's um, some interesting things though that we need to address and to see how somebody like Wagner that God had used ended up going astray. So it's not the most cheerful topic. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the light that has come from your word in regard to your love towards us and the way that you are seeking to draw us closer to you, uh, to save us from this world of sin. And we pray for each person who is searching uh, for truth, especially those that are, are struggling uh, with their own weaknesses and sins and um, see no hope. Um, we pray, Lord, that your spirit can comfort them <clears throat> and that you can bring Open peace. As we look at E.J. Wagner's uh, sad confession of faith, we just pray, Lord, that we can learn from this um, about ourselves and about our need of you, and um, that it can help us in the trials ahead. Uh, be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again. So, we all know that Jones and Wagner ended up having some problems. Uh, in regard to the church, A.T. Jones, and we're going to read some A.T. Jones as well. His, I uh, uh, can't remember the title of it, uh, An Appeal for Evangelical Christianity, something like that, uh, that he presented at the 1909 uh, General Conference. So we'll see, we'll see where A.T. Jones went astray, uh, though he did repent uh, of that later. And we're going to see where Wagner went astray. Now, there's lots of different rumors about Jones and Wagner. and I've, I've heard lots of things that people just repeat, even though there's no real information on them. Um, <clears throat> so one thing we do know about Wagner is, and, and we know about Jones as well, is that the issue or the conflict that happened with John Harvey Kellogg affected uh, their relationship to the church. So one of the problems that we had within the church at that time is you had uh, the ministerial work and the medical work. And these two were not generally in harmony with each other. Kellogg, who was running um, Battle Creek Sanitarium, he was, uh, I don't know the word to use, I'll, I'll say creative. He was, he was a more artistic type. And, uh, even though he is a doctor, he was he was a very popular figure, and he sought to have a sanitarium that would be a world class medical institution, and it did attract uh, very wealthy people and important people from all over the world. To know exactly what went on in the heart of Kellogg, uh, we know that uh, a lot of it was a battle that he was having with uh, the ministers. So. Uh, Kellogg, who wrote a book called Colin Hygiene, um, was very strict in, in diet and health reform. And uh, a lot of our ministers were not. <clears throat> so uh, there was a conflict in that area. Plus, uh, Kellogg sought to control the sanitarium and the ministerial part of the church uh, sought to control the sanitarium as well. And they had very different visions. People like A.T. Jones, who accepted health reform. He was friends with Kellogg. And with Wagner, Wagner ended up being involved in pantheism, something which Jones never got involved in, but Wagner and Kellogg both did. And, and Wagner, because he went to England, and it was a very popular uh, idea, this sort of was very spiritual um, idea and Wagner got caught up that in that in in England 
he wrote a book called um, The Everlasting Covenant, I think, which is replete with all kinds of pantheistic ideas. Actually, a bit more overt than what you see in uh, Kellogg's book, um, <clears throat> The Living Temple, uh, for which uh, the Battle Creek, uh, the printing house there, was burnt down. The uh, Review and Herald uh, building was, there was a fire there. And I believe, at least, I, I haven't looked into it recently, but, you know, the uh, it it delayed the publication of The Living Temple. The plates were burnt or something. So some people attribute that. So we know that Wagner and Jones both went astray and, and for different reasons. With Jones, my assessment of it, of everything that I read, is that Jones just took too personally uh, the opposition that was happening uh, to the message. And he wanted to see Christ returning in the clouds of heaven. And the rejection of that message hindered that work and he took it personally, and he also took um, the work, in a sense, into his own hands instead of leaving it in God's hands. When I was a young man and I read A.T. Jones and I, I looked at his life, I could see that some of those same types of uh, characteristics were in my own character that needed to be reformed. And so I took, you know, Ella White's counsel to A.T. Jones uh, to myself. Personally, I applied it to myself. And, and that helped me a great deal. So what we're going to look at today is this, um, it's called a confession of faith or confession of faith. Um, it's really uh, E.J. Wagner rejecting the Adventist message. And we want to look at it. One is because there are things we can learn from it. We can learn how people can once know the truth and how they come to embrace error and the reasoning that they can use. But sometimes people don't use any reasoning at all. It's just completely emotional. But some people need or feel that they, they have to justify uh, their position. And that's kind of what this is. It's a justification of his position. Um, so it says here, of course, the manuscript was the last thing written by J. Wagner was found on his desk after his death. And he died May 28th, 1916. <clears throat> The letter is printed in response to the request of his friends, many of whom desire to possess a copy. Now, I'm not sure who he was writing to it, writing it to, but it says, dear brother. So we'll, we'll start reading through this and we'll have some comments about it. <clears throat> Ever since you were here last summer, I've had it on my mind to write you a long letter, in which I could express myself as freely as though I were talking to you. I had it in mind before you came, but hesitated not knowing how it would strike you. I did not want you to get the idea that I was in any sense on a war path or desirous of controversy. I didn't really believe that you would misunderstand my motive because you had already written to me that you would like to talk over some items of denominational belief with me. Uh, but there were so many things to discuss then, and I had no idea that we should be together even so long as we were. It didn't seem opportune to introduce any leading topic. First, I wish I could tell you how much we enjoyed your brief visit. It was really a great blessing to us, and you were kind enough to express the hope that I might again be connected with um, with the work. Now, we're looking here at a just a computer transcription of this, so it is connected again with the work. I guess there's some quotation marks or something. Um, I'm, I'm actually can look at the. The, the actual PDF, but the PDF is kind of hard to read. It's not it's not high resolution, so this is actually easier to read. Um, and he says, I, I remember that both you and Brother Blank expressed the same wish when you called on me a few minutes on your way home from the general conference. Your brotherly kindness touched me. It's not making sense. Just hang on. For some reason, <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> Yeah, your brotherly kindness uh, touched me, although neither then nor at any time since that since have I for a moment entertained the thought that such a thing could ever take place, nor can I say that I have wished it under the present conditions. Although I cherish the tenderest memories of my association 
with many former fellow workers. But I was glad for the kind wish and for the brotherly spirit that prompted it. And it furnished an additional reason why I should write this letter as a sort of confession of faith that you may know more clearly where I stand. I may and may see that it is not indifference that keeps me out of the work. It is indeed as a confession of faith and not as an expression of disbelief of old doctrines that I should like to have to consider this particular statement of, of my um, ground for knowing that I could not be, and I don't know why some of this might be, maybe it might be easier reading the other document. You got a separation of the words, the letters, I mean. Yeah. So they end up with this, uh, no, where did the document go? Um, I got so many things open here. I had this open and I can't find it now. So what does he say here? Yeah, it's when they're underlining stuff in this thing and the thing converts it, it can't read it. Uh, so he says, um, has made me see more clearly than ever before that Paul was not a theologian. So I, I'm going to switch to this other document. I didn't realize this one was so bad. Maybe, maybe it looks okay on your computer, this one. That Paul was yeah, not I, can a, I can see it on there. Okay, but that he simply stated self-evident truths, truths really as self-evident as any axiom in mathematics. Now, I'm not sure if I agree with him on that point, but anyway. But the truths are packed closely together, each word often containing a distinct thought, and the hasty reader is likely to imagine that there is a maze of philosophical and theological arguments when there is only a mass of simple ultimate truths, which I would agree with him um, in that sense. Each independently true and convincing when looked at by itself, but it takes a lot of close scrutiny to distinguish the boundaries of each and then to see them all blended, blending into one harmonious whole. Christ is primarily the word of God the expression of God's thought. And the scriptures are the word of God simply because they reveal Christ. It was with this belief that I began my real study of the Bible 34 years ago. At that time, Christ was set before my eyes, evidently crucified before me. I was sitting a little part from the body of the congregation at the large tent at a camp meeting in Healdsburg one gloomy Sabbath afternoon. I have no idea what was the subject of the discourse, not a text nor a word have I ever known. All that has remained with me was what I saw. Suddenly a light shone round me, and the tent was for me far more brilliantly lighted than if the noonday sun had been shining, and I saw Christ hanging on the cross, crucified for me. In that moment, I had my first positive knowledge, which came like an overwhelming flood that God loved me, and that Christ died for me. God and I were the only beings I was conscious of in the universe. I knew then, by actual sight, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. I was the whole world with all its sin. And I am sure that... And i got to move this over. I'm sure that Paul's experience on the way to Damascus was no more real than mine. Now, you know, remember he's telling of his experiences 34 years earlier. And and even though Wagner is trying to say this is not a rejection of Adventist doctrines that he once believed, old doctrines he once believed, really that's what this paper is. And his appealing to his original conversion is not, I, I guess for me it's, it, it's not convincing that is something has happened in his experience. He has wandered away from God and he's going to appeal to his experience in the past. Can our experience in the past stand today? Well, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know, you know, it's not once saved, always saved, right? <clears throat> right. You know, so we could, you know, what's that? sanctification right so so he's going to appeal to to something that god did in his life which 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 i believe you know that god did but i don't i don't accept that we can we can look at our past experience 
and say, well, because God did this in my life, that means I must be on the correct path now. We can depart from the truth, right? So just because, you know, we believe something true at one time, um, it's kind of interesting. There is uh, something I posted on my Facebook. It was just, uh, you know, they ask you to do uh, a memory thing, right? You know, uh, looking in a memory. And, and this is the memory um, that I had. So I, I, I posted it on March 1st, 2020. And, and so it was from four years ago, of course. And, and so I just reposted it. And this says, the Lord will not lead minds now to set aside the truth that the Holy Spirit has moved upon his servants in the past to proclaim. So it's, it's pretty opportune that it's there. Um, because God will not teach us something and then have us set us aside. If, if we are going to set aside the truth, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. If God's servants have in the past proclaimed this truth, for us to believe that the Holy Spirit has moved upon us in some way is a deception. We need to, we need to keep that in mind in, in the time that we are in this movement. Because one thing we do see is that God unfolds his light to us. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. Right? We know that God's light, his truth, is progressive. And every time we have new light, it establishes old light. So anytime somebody has new light and says, well, I have new light, and this new light is what we used to teach was wrong, it's not new light. Correct? What what used to be, you mean? Yeah. So so new light will make, you know, for instance, if we look at the lines of how we've come to understand the lines in this movement, we have not taken a position. We were wrong. And now we have to correct the mistake. Our position is we didn't understand some things fully, but what we learn now establishes what we understood before as being true. Right, right. right. So, so sometimes people think, well, you know, we have new light and that new light is going to uh, disregard something that was an established truth. And it won't. It will all new new light will always make the old light, the old truth shine brighter. Okay. Yeah, give, so, it, give it more give it more clarity. Yeah. And and that's what I've found in this movement as we continue to move through time. Things that we understood, they're still true, but we understand them in a deeper way and we understand their connections more. And and there are things that we we, we, because we didn't understand fully, we sometimes drew wrong conclusions. But as we have new light, it becomes clear that God was leading in how we were understanding things. It wasn't just, not just that we were, we weren't mistaken. We just didn't see all of the connections. So, so I have a hard time when somebody appeals to the past. You know, well, I was, you know, converted in such and such a time and, you know, God's been working in my life. And some of those things I used to believe, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, I no longer believe them because, you know, the Holy Spirit has shown me they're not important or whatever it is. Right. There's some other truth. And often what it is, is a person departing from true belief and, and a true godliness in their life and using uh, an intellectual excuse why they don't have to follow certain things. So we know about Wagner. You know, he ended up uh, getting divorced and remarried. He had been committing adultery. Um, and that's really where he went astray. And so all of this, this intellectual exercise that he's going to have here to sort of justify his position, uh, he's going to try to paint it that this is just God revealing truth to him. But since it contradicts what God has revealed uh, to his servants in the past, it can't be truth. So um, 
Now, he says here it was an impersonal, extra-biblical revelation for no text and no human being was connected with the experience. So I'm, I'm not sure why he means impersonal. I guess he just means no other person. So there was no person involved. I would say it's probably a personal experience, but he's using it in a different sense here. But believing that the Bible is God's revelation to man, a revelation of himself, I knew that it must have been designed for the giving of just such a revelation as I had that day. I knew and still know that from the Bible, the gospel teacher is to be set forth by the spirit, what no ear has ever heard nor can hear and what has never entered into the heart of man. So what is he saying here? He's saying that there can come into our understanding from the Bible things that no one has ever thought of before, that no one's ever heard, they've, they, they never heard nor can hear, and, and what has never entered into the heart of man. So he's paraphrasing a Bible verse. I resolved at once that I would study the Bible in the light of that revelation in order that I might help others see the same truth. I have always believed that every part of the Bible must be set forth or more, with more or less vividness, that glorious revelation. And when I did not see it or some direct connection with it in any portion of scripture, I have known that I did not understand it and have refrained from attempting to teach such portions until I could see the light shining from them. So that means he's he's studying the Bible, always keeping before him that revelation that he had, that God loves him and died for him. Okay. Christ must be the beginning and end of all scripture, as he is the author and perfecter of faith. It was the spirit of Christ that testified in the ancient prophets, and so the scriptures are the testimony of Jesus testimonies to which the psalmist so frequently refers. We know God, first of all, as the creator in Christ, in that living word that was God in the beginning, that was God in the beginning, in that living word that was God in the beginning, everything exists. For in him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together or consist. So uh, this sentence here, uh, so God is, first of all, the creator in Christ. So Christ is the creator. God uses Christ. And in that living word that was God in the beginning, everything exists. So we know that they exist by Christ spoke things into existence. For in him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist or hold together. So he's he's using this. Now, he has some, his own understanding about what he's saying. So if we read it, we just see it for what it is. <clears throat> but anyway, we'll go into that later as he brings out some of these ideas. Uh, therefore, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God saves, um, and I have to switch over to this other page. God saves by his creative power. Creation is first and last and all the time. God created everything perfect. Man's disobedience brought sin into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden and God with whom is no variable uh, variableness, neither shadow that is cast by turning redeems all by the continued exercise of the same power that brought all into being. God is not taken, was not taken by surprise for he himself knew what he would do. No new work was instituted. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. You know, Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the everlasting word that upholds all things still continues to work effectually as in the beginning. Whoever believes it becomes conscious that it works effectually in him. If any man be in Christ, there is a new creation. This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today 
and forever. He cannot change because he is the revelation, the outshining of the unchangeable God. His goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. He quotes that in his um, uh, book, Christ and His Righteousness, or the Righteousness of Christ. Therefore, the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, must always be the same, with no shadow of change. It was the same before the foundation of the world, when only angels had been created. At first, it was the good news of God's power in creation, and the angels sang together and shouted for joy. Later, it was the good news of God's power in creating anew. And again, the angels sang together and shouted for joy. But no new feature has ever been introduced because the power of God is necessarily an uncha as unchangeable as God himself. God has not grown greater, stronger, or better as the ages have passed because he was as great and strong and good in the beginning as he could be always infinite in everything. So he's he's building up to some ideas here. So, I mean, we can agree with these ideas, you know, that Christ is the one that created and it demonstrates God's power and 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 God is unchangeable. Um, and then he says, so Christ is the all sufficient sacrifice from before the foundation of the world. It was through him that pardon was offered to Lucifer and his deluded host before man was created. The offering was rejected because Satan would not acknowledge or would acknowledge no greater than himself. And as he knew perfectly what he was doing, his probation ceased. And so Christ, in coming to the earth, took not on him the nature of angels, but only that of sinful man. From the simple truth that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the shining forth of his glory, the manifestation of his unchangeable character, himself the same yesterday and all the yesterdays and today and forever, we must believe and know that from the days of eternity of old until now Christ has exercised the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. He was born to the throne not merely in Bethlehem, but from his goings forth. From the beginning, he was constituted heir of all things. Yet have I set literally anointed on a king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, this idea of prophet, priest, and king, you're going to find it in A.T. Jones' book, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection. He's going to expand on that as well. Now, Wagner's referring to lots of things that people would know about. So in some ways, you know, we read this, it's a little bit cryptic, in, you know, but he, he's speaking to people who understand these topics. So prophet, Christ has certainly ever been since as the living word. He has spoken for God. He is the mouthpiece of a divinity. He was the prophet of God in the beginning when the heavens and earth were created, since it was by him that the creative word was uttered. And he was the same prophet when he came preaching peace to all, both near and far. God was preaching peace by Jesus Christ centuries before Christ appeared in Judea. And he, he references Isaiah 57, verse 19. And how about the priesthood? A thousand years before Christ, so this is going to be this point here. Before Christ appeared in the flesh among men, David wrote by inspiration, Jehovah said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool, uh, which is kingship. And Jehovah hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So hopefully you can kind of pick up on some of these pieces to see where he's going with this. Further, it is as true of Christ as of high priests taken from among men that he is ordained to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. None but a priest can offer a sacrifice acceptable to God. King Uzziah affords a sad proof of this, and therefore Christ's priesthood must necessarily have antedated his offering of himself. Obviously, then, he was priest before his crucifixion. Now, there are some problems with what Wagner is saying. What would be these problems? How would we address, maybe, maybe you don't notice yet. He was priest before his crucifixion. Yeah. 
agree with that. Well, so, so I mean, the, the idea is he's going to end up rejecting the sanctuary message, right? As we understand it as Seventh-day Adventists. I'm just going to f- see if I can find it here. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to switch over here to A.T. Jones' introduction to a consecrated way to Christian perfection. And you're going to see that Jones and, and Wagner are going to be at odds with each other. Um, so he says he was a prophet before the crucifixion. And, and Jones is going to offer, uh, show that this is, is not the case. But anyway, in the manifestation of Christ the Savior, it is revealed that he must appear in the three offices of prophet, priest, and king. Of him as a prophet, it was written in the days of Moses, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will uh, put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Uh, in Deuteronomy 18, 18 and verse 19. And this thought was continued in the succeeding scriptures until his coming. Of him as priest, it was written in the days of David, yet have I set anointed uh, my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Psalm 2, verse 6. So Wagner quoted this verse. And this thought likewise was continued in all the scriptures afterward unto his coming, after his coming, and unto the end of the book. Thus the scriptures abundantly present him in three offices of prophet, priest, and king. The threefold truth is generally recognized by all who have acquaintance with the scriptures. But above this, there is the truth which seems to be not so well known that he is not all three of these at the same time. The three offices are successive. He is prophet first, then after that he is priest, and after that he is king. He that he was that prophet when he came into the world, as that teacher come from God. The word made flesh and dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. Acts 3, 19 to 23. But he was not then a priest, nor would he be a priest if he were even yet on earth. For it is written, if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Hebrews 8, verse 4. But having finished his work in his prophetic office on earth, and having ascended to heaven at the right hand of the throne of God, he is now and there our great high priest, Whoever liveth to make intercession for us, as it is written, he shall be priest upon his father's throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. But he was not that priest when he was on earth as that prophet. So now he is not that king when he is in heaven as that priest. True, he is king in the sense um, and in the fact that he is upon his father's throne. And thus he is the mighty, he is the kingly priest and the priestly king after the order of Melchizedek, who through priest of the Most High God was also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, Hebrews 12 verse, or 7, verse 1 and 2. But this is not the kingly office and throne that is referred to and that is contemplated in the prophecy and the promise of his specific office as king. The kingly office of the promise and prophecy is that he shall be king upon the throne of his father David in perpetuation of the kingdom of God upon this earth. This kingly office is the restoration and the perpetuation in him of the diadem, the crown and the throne of David, which was discontinued when, because of the profanity and wickedness of the king and the people of Judah and Israel, they were taken captive to Babylon when it was declared, and thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, when iniquity shall have an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Now, we studied this in connection with some of Jeff's articles uh, dealing with Daniel, um, I believe it was Daniel chapter 2. And and Jeff was making an argument dealing with the Sunday law. I don't remember all the details of what Jeff was saying. In the article, it's one of the early ones, but he was making an argument that Christ became king at at the at the second coming, I believe. And I'm trying to remember how that worked. He, he was making this argument regarding the Sunday law, and 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 I can't remember enough of it. It was because one is it was 
was rather confusing. It didn't, didn't really follow or make sense. My argument was that the kingdom, the final kingdom, the Roman kingdom, has to end before Christ returns. And that Roman kingdom, we are still in the Roman kingdom, right? So we know when they they um, take off the crown, right, it's going to be taken by Babylon. Babylon is going to conquer um, the kings of Judah. He's going to you know, take them captive, and he's going to kill Zedekiah. And then it says, I will overturn, right? So then it's going to go to Medo-Persia. And then I will overturn. And it's going to go to Greece. And then I will overturn. And it goes to Rome. And then he shall come whose right it is. Now, this is not the first coming. Right. So as he says here, thus and at that time, the throne, the diadem, the crown of the kingdom of David was discontinued until he come whose right it is when it will be given him. And he whose right it is, is only Christ, the son of David. And this coming was not his first coming when he came in his humiliation, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But it is his second coming when he comes in his glory as king of kings and lord of lords, when his kingdom shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms of earth and shall occupy the whole earth and and shall stand forever. Right. And it is true. When he was born into the world, a babe in Bethlehem, he was born king of king and then and has ever since king by right. But it is equally true that his kingly office, diadem, crown, and throne of the prophecy and promise, he did not then take and is not yet taken and will not take until he comes again. Then it will be that he will take to himself his great power upon this earth and will reign fully and truly in all the splendor of his kingly office and glory. For in the scripture, it is portrayed that after the judgment was set and the books were opened, one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. Then it is that he shall indeed take the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Thus, it is plain that in the contemplation of scripture, uh, in the contemplation of the promise and the prophecy, as to his three offices of prophet, priest, and king, these offices are successive and not all nor even any two of them at the same time. He came first as that prophet. He is now that priest and will be that king when he comes again. He finished his work as that prophet before he became that priest. And he finishes his work as that priest before he will become that king. Right. So we could read more, but you get the idea here. Now, I hope this is helpful for people because, you know, one of the things I find is, these types of truths um, aren't generally presented in Adventism, and they are, are quite important. And, and Wagner's departure uh, from Adventism is, is a rejection of this truth. So if we go back to Wagner's article, so you can see that Wagner's actually talking in a context when he's, he's talking about this topic, which, you know, we we hardly ever talk about. I mean, he's addressing Jones' position and he's he's making a statement about where he stands on this issue. Um, so he says, further it is true of Christ as a high priest taken from among men that he is ordained to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. None but a priest can offer a sacrifice acceptable to God. King Uzziah affords a sad proof of this, right? So we read this. Uh, um, and then he says, obviously, then he was priest before his crucifixion. Now, is that true? According to what Jones presented. Now, it says he gave himself for our sins, just as truly when he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, saying to the broken spirit, thy sins be forgiven thee and living life to the dead as when he hung upon the cross. Isaiah declared the Lord hath laid on him. 
the iniquity of us all. And surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So his priesthood must date back to Isaiah's um, back of Isaiah's time. And since grace was abounding at the fall of man, for where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, we must believe that Christ was priest at least from the foundation of the earth. So what Wagner is going to argue, and I think you should be able to see it, is that the idea that Christ is our high priest now in heaven is an irrelevant truth because he's always been a high priest. That That's going to be Wagner's view. Now, yeah, like you said, you said before the cross, he was a priest. Mention that. He tries to say, well, he's, but when you could see even the thing sense, is Christ always been a king? Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, is he a prophet? Well, you know, he speaks for God. Right. I mean, yeah. but, but Jones is quite clear that there are specific periods of time in which he operates as a prophet. Even though we can look at Isaiah time and it talks about his priesthood, we know that there is a time when he takes the office of a priest, which is after his crucifixion, right? Because he has to then minister as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And, and that's not going to begin till the day of Pentecost. So Wagner is going to reject the ideas behind Adventism. And, but he's not, he's not going to do a good job of it. Right. As you can see, he's but he and, he, and he's not going to go, you know, point by point with Jones and try to argue. He's going to use a more philosophical argument, which is kind of odd because he talks about how Paul speaks so plainly and, and just says the axiomatic truths. And and what what he's really trying to argue is these things should just be self-evidently true. Right. What he's stating here. In, in his confession, that really there's no way that you can argue with. It. That is, a, an axiomatic truth is like a mathematical truth. It's something true by definition. Uh, a, a good idea of an axiom would be, you know, the idea of definitional truths. So, um, for instance, a bachelor is a an unmarried, never married um, male, right? Man, human human being. You, you can't argue that. You can't say, no, a bachelor is is something else. You know, a married man is a bachelor because that goes against the definition. And so Wagner is trying to use, he's trying to finesse his position by just by just stating things as being true without proving them from God's word. He uses some examples, but he ignores other things. And, and the reason why this is important, we see people doing this all the time. We see people doing this with different doctrines, feast keeping, um, lunar Sabbaths, um, anti-Trinitarianism, uh, different types of ideas, even within this movement that people are trying to finesse. And, and they're not well established. And one is they reject light that has already been given. And, and, and what people will say is, well, new light, you know, Ellen White didn't believe something because she didn't have light on that. And, and so what she said was not true because we now have new light. We saw this with Parminder's group. You know, Ellen White just spoke the way she spoke because she was a, a 19th uh, or an eighth and yeah, 19th century, uh, American woman. And so she had certain beliefs that just were true in that time but aren't true today because truth is ever changing dispensationally. Right. So, so this is an important point. So we need to, we need to, in understanding this issue of righteousness, by faith, I really hate actually going through this of what Wagner is saying, because it's, it's very sad, but it is a lesson we need to learn. We need to be able to examine ourselves and the tendency that human nature has to depart from truth for self-justification. So we know that Christ is a priest, but his office as a priest does not date back to Isaiah's time in the sense in which it is understood in the scriptures. Remember, God is outside of time. So when Isaiah is appealing to Christ, just as when a man offers a sacrifice, 
That sacrifice represents Christ's sacrifice that's going to happen in the future. Even though Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, we know that there is a historical time that Christ is crucified. Now, you could argue, and Wagner does argue this, that Christ is always constantly being crucified. But the Bible plainly says that Christ is going to be crucified once at the end of the world, right? Which Paul is talking about. His Yeah. Right? So Christ isn't constantly crucified. That's a Catholic idea. Every time they have a mass and the priest calls Christ down from heaven, that he's crucifying the Son of God in afresh, in a sense, in in the sacrifice of the mass. You've heard that idea? Yeah. yeah. And, and what a similar idea. And what and in his book, um, the uh, the everlasting covenant, he tries to argue that every time you eat bread, it is a a sense of sacrifice of Christ. He says that the the Catholic priests don't go far enough. That everything is 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 stamped with the cross of Christ. Christ is in a sense being constantly crucified. And and this sort of philosophical argument uh, ignores the plain statements of Scripture. So we know that obviously grace abounds, sins abounds, but we're not going to make the argument that that Christ was the priest from the foundation of the world. He is a priest, right? But he's not having the office of a priest from the foundation of the world. He's not... He's not constantly being sacrificed from the foundation of the world. He was promised from the foundation of the world, but he wasn't actually crucified in, you know, in a prophetic sense at the foundation of the world. And he wasn't our high priest at the foundation of the world. But this is what Wagner is going to argue. And this, this point, this position is going to cause him to reject anything doing with dealing with the investigative judgment. And he's going to make some very poor arguments it was pretty uh, presumptuous. Yeah. It was pretty, and, pretty presumptuous, yeah. Well, you know, and, and I can't help but think, you know, how similar the situation is in the movement presently. Because God has been leading this movement. We have to accept that. But if we start to say, well, God wasn't really leading this movement, that this movement was hijacked, you know, whenever it was, 2013 or whatever. And that, you know, that somehow, you know, we were off track completely. I wouldn't trust a movement that would allow itself to be hijacked uh, for 10 years. You understand what I'm saying there? That that's not how God has operated ever in any line. Apostasy is apostasy. If we were apostate, you could argue that, that we we were teaching all kinds of error and, but God, God wasn't leading us, but he can't then suddenly lead us again. We would be apostate. Okay. Anyway, let's go on. Abraham offered up his only begotten son by faith uh, in God's ability to raise him up even from the dead through the offering already made of his only begotten son. Now, we know the offering was not already made of Christ. The works by faith in which we do enter into rest were finished from the foundation of the world, and that's true, right? These simple vital truths do not admit of argument. They say themselves, that is, they're axiomatic in his view. They have only to be believed. I'm merely stating what comes to me as I read the Bible for personal help and comfort. Now, these plain fundamental truths being recognized, it necessarily follows that there can have been no change in any feature of the gospel, call it the plan of salvation, if you please, since the fall. Clear statements of it to meet man's increasing blindness there have been, but the thing itself has not changed one iota. Now, you see where he's going here as well. Now, do we believe that there was a change in the plan of salvation? No. No. But we do believe that there was... Uh, that God has um, dealt with human beings in a progressive way, right? We do have different dispensations, wow. right? I mean, yeah. You know, God leads the Israelites out of Egypt, um, and he's going to, 
you know, have Moses as, um, you know, his mouthpiece. You know, Aaron's going to be the high priest. We have actually, uh, you know, priests that are literal men. Now, those things are are types of something that are going to come. But so the plan of salvation, everybody's been always saved by grace through faith. But but the external application of it differs. There are dispensations. And he's arguing that there isn't. Right? That God never dispenses his gospel at different ways in different times. And that's clearly a contradiction of the scriptures. Uh, clear statements of it to meet man's increasing blindness there have been. So he just says it's stated differently. But the thing itself has not changed one iota. Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And we believe this. I mean, obviously, the gospel in its essence is the same. But it's in its manifestation, it appears different. We believe that by grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. The unchangeable God has but one way of saving men. Any change would make either the perfection, either for perfection or for imperfection. No one will for a moment admit that God would or could make a change tending towards imperfection. But to claim the change toward perfection would be no less to bring a charge of imperfection against God. Now, this is um, what we would call um, equivocation. That is, taking the meanings of a word in one sense and applying them in a different sense to make an argument. So, for instance, when somebody grows, is there change? Do we change from being a baby to being an old man? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Is that change? Um, from glory. From What's glory that? to glory. Right. From so glory it's not. To glory. So change does not mean change from perfection to imperfection or from imperfection to perfection. Right. Now, now we're just using the example of, of human beings, but God's work of salvation for man is a progressive work. There are steps. As we go follow the steps to Christ, we change in our relation to God. God is not the one changing. The gospel is not changing. But man is changing. So this is not, so to, uh, to argue that it has to, if you have something perfect, something perfect can't change. Well, we know that a seed, when it grows, it's perfect in every step of its growth, right? If it's, you know, a healthy seed. So, so he's trying to use the word perfection in the sense of ultimate perfect, something that can't be changed. But that's not the perfection we see in, in God's creation. We can't say that because if you had, if you had, if God made the world perfect, does, it, does that mean that it could never grow or change? That plants wouldn't grow because they were perfect already? Anything changed from perfection would be an imperfection? It's a silly it's argument. Grow and, pro and progress, you know. Yeah. So, so it, he, he's not making a very good argument, but, but it can fool people. And that's what equivocation is for using, changing the definition of a word. Um, so obviously something that's perfect can't become imperfect, but it doesn't mean that it can't change. But he says any change would be imperfection for something that's perfect. Because it's already perfect. So if it changes, it must be imperfect. But no, things that are perfect can still change from glory to glory. Believing in God. It's a distorted. Yeah. A distorted view. <laughs> Think about it. But we need to understand this about ourselves, of how we can distort truths by, by playing these types of games. Believing yeah, in God, you must admit that. I like to... I'd also yeah. like to understand for my for myself the application of uh, sanctification in this definition somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, personal sanctification, because fully being fully aware of my imperfections, um, mm -hmm. it's almost imperceptible when I do anything that's good of God doing it in me. I would believe. So I don't know. 
where does sanctification fall into this definition? You're showing us right now a uh, false, dangerous definition, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah, the idea like, that perfection, for instance, the idea of perfection is, um, you know, I've, I've seen people argue that um, Jesus was perfect. Perfection is perfect? Or well, Jesus changes? was perfect. They, they would say Jesus was perfect. That means... He couldn't have, have ever made a mistake. Like when he built his oh. first chair as a carpenter, it was perfect. Yeah. And the question is, right. well, what false do you mean? Definition. It's a false definition of perfection because they have this yeah. idealized idea of perfection. Now, you know, if it's Jesus... A, it's a Greek idea, isn't it? Yeah. So, so Jesus, I mean, in learning something, you know, we all know those that don't make mistakes don't learn anything or don't do anything or something like that. You know, Christ would have had to learn how to be a carpenter. That means he would have to grow and develop as a carpenter to become a better carpenter. He couldn't have been a perfect yeah. carpenter the first time he started doing carpentry. But I've heard people argue that By he had to. <laughs> right. And so but everything say, that he did, he did to his best of his ability perfectly. Right. Right. I so mean, when he did things, because he learned and applied. Yeah. See, because that's called creature perfection, which doesn't exist. Even in Christ as a human being, he never had creature perfection, but he had a perfection of character. He had a perfect, godly character. Everything he did was to the glory. Well, I'm bring, bringing it back to to me again. <laughs> yeah. But just applying it, you know, in my work life. When I did a job, uh, I took seriously the idea that I was doing it to glorify God. So I'd want to do, always want to do my best. And uh, sometimes self gets in there. You know, you want to be seen as a real good worker, good at your mm -hmm. job. But doing it for God, I remember one time walking up the stairs with a heavy load on my shoulders. And halfway up, I'm struggling. And the second way up, I, I the thought came to me. I'm doing this for God, and I stood up taller, uh, and I got more strength to do the job. Even and it turned out so good. But doing it for God. So this is where this idea of Christ doing things perfectly by His character. So in my character, I was doing that job now perfectly because I was doing it for God. Is right. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because it, it's about and character. Perfect, uh, uh, and as Ellen White says, that a small plant is perfect at every stage of its growth. Right, and that's and that's right. so that so something that grows it doesn't go from perfection to imperfection just because it changed. Okay, so he's making a faulty argument. So he's just saying that God could not have changed, so the gospel must always have been the same. So there couldn't have been a time when Christ wasn't our high priest. So the idea that he's going to be our high priest, you know, after his resurrection. Um, you know, ministering in the heavenly sanctuary, and then that he's going to be moved to the most holy place. It, you know, he, Wagner's going to reject all of that. So he says, believing in God, we must admit that the gospel was the same and as complete in the beginning as it is now. Now, now the word complete is is a synonym for perfect. Perfect, right? We know that. It seems to be, yeah. Okay, so. So if we have um, something that's complete, like a plant growing when it matures, it's perfect even when it's not complete. Now, we know that the gospel has a time in which it is complete, in which it goes to maturity. God's work on this earth in salvation has a progression. And you can't say it was complete in the beginning, because if it was complete in the beginning, why are we here? Now, the gospel is not completed yet. So we can use the complete, the word complete, and understand that, that there comes a time when God's work of recreation, of making the earth, earth new, comes to completion, comes to perfection, comes to maturity. And, and that is God's plan of salvation. It's not something that is the same right from the beginning to the end in the sense that it's complete all the way through. It can't possibly be. There comes a time when it, it is complete. It is a progression of work that God has done on this earth. 
through the various dispensations. So, so his argument is faulty, for it is but the revelation of the life of God to and in man dead in sin. That is the gospel, but that is not complete. Okay, man had one, but one need since the fall, salvation from sin. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Sin carries the death in its bosom and is essentially death. Therefore, the need that man suffers can be satisfied only by the gift of a perfect life, a life free from sin, a life victorious over death. So God in Christ gave his life for and to sinful men. That is the sum of the gospel. Okay, so, I mean, he's partly true here, right? I mean, now he's using the word sum, right? So he's used the word uh, perfect. He's used the word complete. And he's used the word sum. Now, the sum is is the adding up of something to completion, right? So we know that there comes a time in which this work is completed when the sum of the gospel is com- is added up. It's tallied, right? But that's not now. You can't just argue because man has need of a savior now. That means that the work of salvation has been completed. We know that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, right? It is a progression, but sin is a condition, not an entity. Now, why does he say this? I I I don't know, but on the topic of sin, it brings brings to mind a quote that God must destroy sin and... If the sinner does not let go of his sin, God must, th- thus, God must destroy the sinner. Yeah. Because he's destroying the sin that he's holding on to. Right. So that's kind of, yeah. Yeah, this is kind of. So I would, is it not sin, something that we hold on to? Though? So. Sin is a condition in the Bible. It is also an entity. Right. So this is what I okay. think. <laughs> So this is a like, false, is that right then? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a false dichotomy. Like it's true, sin is a condition. But that doesn't mean that it's not there. Yeah, and, and, and someone else was gonna say something there too. Okay. I didn't hear anything. Started to. Okay, well. <clears throat> so it is uh it is not only a condition being what do you mean an entity? Well, so an entity something just means take and handle a thing. A thing. Yeah. Solid thing? It's not well, solid. It doesn't necessarily need to be solid to be a thing. Or, is it, or perhaps like they like I've heard said that Jesus was more solid than the door when he walked through it. What he's gonna try to say here is he's gonna try to argue that sin can't be uh transported. Right? So you'll see okay. what he means. And this is a false argument. So so he he sets up a premise by creating a false dichotomy, two different things that he believes are mutually exclusive. If it's a condition, it can't be an entity. If it's an entity, it can't be a condition. And so he's saying it's a condition, not an entity. So he says it exists only in the individual and can be removed only by a new life in the individual. It is not like grain or wood or stone that can be removed from a place and deposited somewhere else. It is like a disease. It is. Sounds like work. Yeah. But just listen. Sounds like work. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I'm having trouble following. Yeah, he's making an argument that our sins can't be transported from one person to another. Or from from us to Christ. This is Wagner. This is Wagner. This is Wagner talking? Okay. So, okay. And Wagner's giving a position that there's some problems with that Jones is going to address. Um, I'm waiting for the the, uh, correct side here. Compare it to compare it. Oh, well, we were talking about the correct side, but 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 I'll I'll just provide it because we know as a Seventh Day Adventist what he's saying is wrong. So so yeah. Wagner is saying well, that, uh, does Jones write against this that you're going to be telling us about sharing with us? No, because Jones isn't oh, writing okay. against this. Jones just happened. Oh, okay. to, Wagner was actually responding to something that Jones had said years earlier, right? So he knew about what Jones was saying about prophet, priest, and king, 
and he's going to contradict Jones. And now, and now he's okay. setting up. So I just happened to know that, that A.T. Jones, what he had said about prophet, priest, and king in the introduction in the consecrated way to Christian perfection. Um, so, so that's I why more, I was one of the more, I was one of the more challenging math students too, because I always wanted to know why. Just because it is. Anyway, okay, I'm let's gonna... go on to read this here. We want to look at his argument first. It exists only yeah. in the individual and can be removed only by a new life in the individual. It is not like grain or wood or stone that can be removed from place a place and deposited somewhere else. It is like a disease. It is, in fact, a mortal disease. It can no more be removed from a person and carried by another person and deposited in some place at a distance from the sinner then a fever can be taken away from a sick man by the physician and stored away in some warehouse provided for the purpose. So he's creating what we call a, um, I'm just pointing out all these logical fallacies. So this is a, um, um, I can't think of the technical name for this, but it's basically uh, a uh, using a comparison that is um analogy it's a false analogy right so it's true we can say that sin is like a disease but that's not the only thing it's like so just because we can compare a sin to a disease in certain aspects of sin we can't just say that's all it is and we see this in adventism dealing with things like uh forensic justification right um judicial justification I can't remember all the different terms, different types of justification. There are different illustrations or examples or analogies that help us understand uh, the work that God does in our life. But we can't take the allergy, analogy and, and make it the rule, make it uh, more than what, than what it is. It's just an analogy. It's just a parable. It's just a comparison of, of two different things. So sin is like a disease, but it's not just like a disease. It's only one aspect. Right. Okay. So um, he says, I am not unmindful of the statement that Christ does bear or take away our sins. He bears the sins of the world. By bearing them, he takes them away from those who accept him as their savior. But I remember this also, that he bears our sins in us and not apart from us. He bears them because he has come in the flesh. Now, there's there's a truth to this, but but he starts to play with these these analogies and 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 bends things. So you're going to see what, what where he's going to go with this. So we'll continue reading. He fully identified with humanity. So this is true. Christ took upon himself our nature. If he had not taken upon himself our nature. He could not have borne our sins, right? So in a sense, you can say our sins are contained within human nature. The sins of the world are upon him because he bears the world. He bore the sins of the world of our common humanity in his own body up to the tree. And by the cross, the body of sin is destroyed that a new life may begin. But let it not be forgotten that the cross on Calvary profits us nothing unless it is erected in our own hearts. And we are crucified with him. Paul shows in Romans 10, verse 6 and 9, that we do not find Christ in heaven or in the grave, but only within, uh, crucified and risen again in our own hearts. And when by faith we know that for a fact our sin is taken away, even Christ does not bear it now because his endless life has swallowed it up. He bears the sin up to the cross. And if we allow him to take us with him to the cross, so that we are crucified with him, our sins cease to be, or they're blotted out with the old life that there ceases ceases to be. And I don't really understand what he's saying here at all, to be honest. It, it's kind well, of meaningless babble. Wasn't Wagner a, a Methodist or a, a you know, which no. faith he came from? I, I don't think he was a Methodist. Okay. I can't remember exactly. I mean, his dad, I mean, I think he was an Adventist because his dad was first an Adventist. Oh, so where I see. He came from, I'm not sure. J.H. Wagner is his dad. 
Uh, sin is not an entity, neither is it a debt in the ordinary sense of the term to be canceled by the payment. So that would be a, another type of way of illustrating the gospel, right? Sin by the payment of something, even of a life by and to some other person apart from the sinner. All the illustrations. So now he's going to talk about these illustrations uh, of the atonement for sin as being the payment for a man's debt by some benevolent person give a faulty idea of the truth. Now, some it's true. It does give a faulty idea, just as saying that sin is a disease gives a faulty idea. If you take uh, this illustration as explaining everything about it, right? We know that sin is a debt, right? The way and we know that you know the wages of sin is death. The Bible is not speaking nonsense. It's illustrating using uh, examples, comparisons with things in the world to explain something. All of these illustrations are imperfect in and of themselves. And so when you argue against uh, one analogy over another analogy, you're making an error, right? We can say sin is not a disease. I mean, in every aspect in which a disease is, right? It has certain aspects like a disease. It has certain aspects like a debt, right? <clears throat> okay, a debt is something apart from the debtor, but sin is part of the sinner. Well, that's kind of silly. I mean, I hate to say it, but when you have an analogy, do analogies always stand on every point? Are they illustrating every aspect? They're not illustrating every aspect of a truth. They can't possibly. They're usually three. They're usually they're usually three legged stools. You take one away and it falls. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's true. This sounds. This sounds. As, as we're as we're reading this, I'm trying to follow it. It sounds mystical and Catholic, like the. Uh, sin being swallowed up in the endless life of Christ, like that's mm -hmm. that has so many nuances of Catholicism. I I don't know. I can't put a finger on it, but it sounds very mystical to me. Right, and he's using philosophy. And, and at the beginning, he talked about how Paul didn't use philosophy. He just stated stated axiomatic truths. And yet, Wagner is is substituting philosophy. For axioms. These are not axioms. These are not things that are evidently true by definition. He is just stating his philosophy, right? So a debt is something apart from the debtor, but sin is a part of the sinner. Well, I don't know. I don't see that there's actually that st sentence is true. I mean, is sin really a part of the sinner? Any any less than a debtor? A debtor? I actually had this thought come to mind. Yeah. I've actually had this thought come to mind recently. I talked about it last time, I think. Uh, recently, I, I was able to uh, was able to think of me separate from that life, that other that life of sin, mm -hmm. and that God is trying to save me, an individual, a person, from that sin. And that sin was actually something that God could make separate from me. I mean, it's so much part of our life in us, but there's a part in us. I won't we go can there and say God from... in you and sort of thing, but, you know, I mean, there is something that, that the value of a soul okay. that's separate from that curse of sin. Like, yeah, so okay. uh, they're, they're two separate things, I think. In a way, yeah. can be by God. Yeah. Now I do want to finish here because I, I, you know, I'm going way over what I usually do. Okay. Um, so all the illustrations of the atonement for sin as being the payment of a man's debt by some benevolent person give a faulty idea of the truth. The debt is something apart from the debtor, but sin is a part of the sinner, which I don't agree with. It is indeed his whole life. It cannot be removed or satisfaction be made for it by the abstract gift of a life any more than consumption, leprosy, or the plague can be cured by the payment of money or even by the gift of a life, unless that new life be given to
to the sufferer himself. There have been cases in which a patient has been healed by the gift of the physicians or some other person, person's life's blood, and this illustrates what Christ does for the sinner. Um, and I don't think I'm going to get through the rest of this. So his, his argument is a little long. I wanted to get to this main point. Demonstrating the case of a woman with the issue of blood, who by the reception of virtue from Christ was immediately made whole, but her disease was not carried off and stored up somewhere. It ceased to exist being swallowed up of life. Yeah. So, so we have these problems, um, that we're going to have to look at when we come to this next Friday. But you're going to see how he ends up rejecting Adventism. It's a completely false basis. Um, and, and you'll be able to poke holes in it, even though he's done a good job of, of weaving together this, this fabric of philosophy. It's, it doesn't really stand. But, you know, and I hate, as I said, I hate actually looking at this, but I do think it's necessary in the time in which this movement is right now. Because we have a lot of similar things happening, um, in this movement. So, um, we need to close with prayer. So let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath and for each person searching for truth. We know, Lord, we need to study these things and understand them for ourselves. And um, we want to have truth in our life. We want to know Christ. We want to his life to fill us and our sins to be removed from us, that we can have a perfect character. We pray for each person. We ask for your angels' care and protection. And we pray for the studies tomorrow. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.